Welcome to Popcorn Psychology, the podcast where we watch blockbuster movies and psychoanalyze them. My name is Brittany Brownfield, and I'm a child therapist, and I'm joined by... Ben Stover, individual therapist. Hannah Espinosa, marriage and family therapist. We're all licensed clinical professional counselors, also known as therapists, who practice out of Chicago. Even though we are licensed mental health professionals, this podcast is purely for entertainment purposes and to fulfill our love of dissecting pop culture in all forms. Please remember that even though we are all licensed therapists, we aren't your therapist. If you are struggling with mental health symptoms, please find a local mental health provider. This is a slightly different episode than we typically do, but very exciting. Um, as you guys know, we talk about um, mental health as it's displayed in movies um, of all different kinds. And so if you wouldn't mind um, having you all introduce yourself to our audience and kind of talk a little bit about this movie, The Retaliators. Go ahead, uh, boys. <laughs> I'm Darren Gear, uh, one of the Gear brothers, a uh, writer of the Retaliators. I am uh, I am Jeff Allen Gear, a uh, uh, brother of Darren and uh, <laughs> co-writer of the uh, Retaliators. And my name is Michael Lombardi, and I'm an actor. Um, I produced and uh, directed some on the Retaliators, and. Uh, I'd like to think of myself as a third brother in this family sometimes. <laughs> we care a lot about yes. these guys. And it was, uh, I'm excited to talk about the project because it's a special one. And um, I think the tone of your podcast will allow these guys to, to tell a story and an inspiration that I think uh, makes this something a little different than perhaps other horror thriller films. So thank you very much for having us. Oh, sure. Thank you for thinking of us. I know we like to take sort of like, we like to take topics and movies that people don't think of that intensely. And then we just go in and we just pull it apart in a way that I think is helpful and people seem to enjoy. So I appreciate you being here and being so game okay. for my questions. So first off, just introducing the movie for anyone listening who hasn't seen it, The Retaliators, I hope I'm going to try to summarize it, but you guys can add to anything I'm missing, is about a um, family who loses their oldest daughter, their teenage daughter, to violence. And so in order to try to get justice for that situation, the father, played by you, Michael, gets involved with a detective who has a very specific brand of justice and how he deals with um retaliating i guess um when things happen in their life so is there anything i missed about the summary that you think would be helpful for the audience to know to give some context to what we're going to talk about yeah well i'll let the writers because i know that they'll have a couple things but i just want to add to that that it certainly is a family but i, I think what's important is that my character's a single dad so True. i think i think that it plays into the story a lot in the relationship with his daughters and sort mm -hmm. of is part of the catalyst that drives him on this tale of revenge. And I think anyone who has a son or a daughter or, 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 or a niece or a nephew, uh, you know, is a certain, a, a shoe in to the understanding those feelings. But I certainly do feel like at least for my preparation for the role, there was a sort of uh, uh, a heightened sense to what happens because of being a single dad, but that, that uh, you gave it, you, you did a beautiful description. <laughs> To add that, uh, you know, and, and see if these guys had anything to sort of put people, uh, you know, put people's ears and minds in the right place when we hit this, the, the rest of this cast. So, mm -hmm. yeah, no, I, I think the the other thing to note about the film that um, uh, certainly we found interesting uh, in writing it and, and again, having to do with Michael's character is uh, Michael is a single father in the film, but he's also a pastor. Mm -hmm. And we, what we thought would be, would make for good drama would be creating a character who is sort of like a, uh, a, a sort of throwback to a sort of classic quote unquote good guy kind of character, like a Jimmy Stewart in a Frank mm. Capra movie um, and, and really make him the real deal, an earnest guy, a very well-meaning guy, not perfect, not, you know, no one is, but certainly, 
you know, just a good person and someone who is a true, true blue pacifist um, have to then go through the, um, uh, the, 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 somebody tempting him into uh, crossing some very, very uh, questionable moral lines Mm -hmm. um in the height of of being sort of at the height of trauma and we sort of thought it would make for again sort of really a, to kind of amp up the drama so when the movie from there without giving away where it goes once he's brought to that line uh but certainly some chaos ensues in a big way and uh so seeing i think the journey of seeing uh, a character like uh, Michael's go through that makes for just uh, uh, hopefully very entertaining ride. That's the that's uh, that was that was the intention. How is psychology or mental health considered when writing a story that has grief and trauma? Like I noticed too that there's the scenes in the movie where they're in even a grief counseling group, and so it made me curious when writing something like that. Where did, um, I guess what informs that? Um, yeah, you know. In this case, uh, well, in, in, in any case, um, when it comes to writing, um, you know, Jeff and I pride ourselves on doing a lot of deep research. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of things are left up to the imagination in writing, but I also think there's a responsibility to really dig in and and um, uh, be resourceful. Um, in the case of the retaliators, because the heartbeat was uh uh was based on a real life trauma in our family we didn't you know we didn't have to do any research uh, sure. uh there right we were when the the nugget of the 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 first i when the idea first popped up which was what if there was this it showed up in the form of what if there was a service for family members of crime victims mm. that provided them one minute alone as sort of a healing. It wasn't even really thought of as uh, the, that original thought wasn't even, it was just as sort of a healing, but then the title, the retaliators kind of came along with that thought that happened right as we were going through. Uh, my sister was, our sister was going through the, uh, trial phase of her whole ordeal which was very grueling and very long and very difficult to go through so it there's you know it doesn't take uh, too much of a leap of uh, uh of imagination to figure that you know psychologically that sort of idea would kind of pop out um mm -hmm. so as far as you know uh you know we, we now we weren't grieving a death Mm -hmm. um but we were grieving a a, a trauma uh and so we sort of kind of used the emotions we were feeling and and you know really one would feel when someone close to you goes through something as heinous as uh, what our sister went through uh we were able to sort of tap into that uh for you know dealing with with sort of bishop and really i'm also a father and uh and and it was sort of it was you know it really was in having a conversation with my dad mm. and hearing his experience of being in the courtroom that made me connect to me being a father and then mm. and then now imagining this is one of my children i'd already been sort of uh caught up in the you know the frustration and pain with it being my sister then tr tr trying to then put myself into my dad's shoes that's what really brought me to uh you know that place and that's really kind of where bishop was born from that the, the character uh, michael's character in okay. the movie so a lot of the research was kind of more homegrown like from like yeah. internal exercises almost yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's really interesting to know. It makes me curious, but it's the question I'll have later, but maybe you can ruminate on it, is sort of how do you practice self-care when engaging in a piece of work, a piece of artwork that is 
not just like psychologically heavy in a general sense, but then it seems like what you, from what you just shared also has a close personal tie to your own story. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, Jeff, you go, you go ahead, Jeff. I was babbling. Go, you go ahead. Yeah. yeah no, no worries. No, no, no. I, I, I think it's a great question. Um, and it really got my mind going on it because I, I never really thought of it that way. Um, because, well, I, I think one thing we did, uh, that didn't, you know, make it too difficult for us to be that close to it was that, you know, the, the story that we're telling is not exactly the story of our, of our sister. Mm -hmm. Um, so it kind of put us with some distance to, to that, you know, I think if we, we had been writing, you know, the, the true story of what happened to our sister. Yeah. Uh, there would be a lot of, you know, um, concerns about self care going through that kind of process in a way that that felt very daunting to to me and uh, to me and Darren, um, and and also we don't we didn't feel like the kind of we were in a position to exactly tell that that story. Um, it, it felt like the story we wanted to tell had more to do with the uh, family members of the victims, mm -hmm. and but we didn't want to sort of tell her story through our point of view. Instead, we we thought, well, let's tell the point of view of, of the, the victims of family members, but a, a different kind of tragic event. And, uh, so I think, you know, uh, it, it didn't feel very challenging in writing it, even though the heartbeat of the story was, was that very tragic event. And I think that was just due to the fact that we didn't, um, we didn't do exactly her story, but still in a way we're, we're able to tie it in. And I, that's where I feel like that was the, the beautiful thing about it was that we were still able to, to uh, honor our sister um, and get her story out there uh, while still making a piece of, you know, entertainment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To add to yeah. that, what these guys what, always said yeah. to me is, look, they want to make a fun, entertaining film. Um, they're huge fans of the genre. They understand the genre, but it was a, actually a healing uh uh, a therapy this is and, and again they're here so they can talk but I, <laughs> right right that's this, the way to put it michael and they yeah. and they, they said to me you know because i i fell in love with the script the moment i read it, it it jumped off the page the characters and the thing is you write what you know and i knew it was good writing and then to find out the inspiration of the story which i think we should get to and uh and we will because we've talked touched upon it a little bit but Darren said to me, you know, uh, we were going through all this and I said to my brother, you know, uh, what if there were a service where you could have a minute alone with the person who harmed your loved one? Mm -hmm. And they started to go off on this thought. And the bottom line is that's the foundation and the number one provocative question of the entire film. If you had a minute alone with the person who hurt or killed your loved one, would you mm -hmm. take it? So this was a uh, now, guys, please take over. But it was sort of a healing process for you writing a fun, entertaining story inspired right. by your sister's tragedy, um, which is why it's so real. And it makes you think a lot when you're watching it, even though it's fun. It's a popcorn movie. You definitely think. But go ahead, boys. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, it's a good segue to what I was going to say, Michael, which was um, writing itself. um is self-care uh, uh, right. in general for, I know for me, and um, and uh, I, Jeff, I don't want to speak for you directly with that, but for me, one of the things coming to discovering writing, sort of been writing all my life in a way, but never doing it formally, um, and Jeff and I made the decision uh, about five years ago to say, hey, let's Let's take this dream we've always had. Let's really do it. Let's let's really go for it. And what I couldn't have imagined was how therapeutic writing in general is. So even when it would rub up against, because there's certainly a lot of Easter eggs, you know, there there's the scene in the movie, you know, spoiler spoiler alert when, when <laughs> the, the scene when the daughter is killed is very much a surrogate for you know the incident that happened with jody you know the real life incident 
Um, and so, you know, that's an example of you know, it's not wasn't an easy scene to write. Um, but in writing it, it felt like therapy. You know, it mm-hmm. felt uh, I had no idea how how sort of therapeutic it would be. I've also lived with uh, anxiety disorder for mm. most of my life um uh pretty severely and i writing has is is a very very uh sort of meditative has become an extremely meditative pleasurable thing so i mean i love writing you know i i hear a lot of interviews with sort of self self self-loathing writers that sort of (laughs) oh i hate to write and i and I love. And when, we're huge fans of Almore Leonard, and I love seeing him in, 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 when he would give interviews. He'd be like, I, "I love writing. I just I can't wait to write." That's very much where we come from. Like we we love it, you know. So, and on the other hand, <laughs> the film and acting in it is was actually quite self destructive. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I would <laughs> tell you, making this thing during COVID and mm-hmm. playing this character, and you know, more more the. Uh, I'm joking because at the end of the day, what I've gotten out of it, um, it has been therapy. And I guess you get to do that as an actor when you're looking through other people's sort of playing different characters and seeing things through a, an imaginary sort of circumstance and trying to understand what people go through, you know, to or what ha- they have gone through to find the truth in it for yourself in a scene or an objective or a, a, of a person. But, you know, it was... Um, uh, the film notes filming during COVID and the different obstacles we had making a movie was definitely challenging to all of us. Yeah. For sure. I bet, you know, what you all are bringing up are actually therapeutic activities or exercises like writing a trauma mm. narrative can right. be a very powerful way to process through something that's happened to us. Also psychodrama yeah. is another mm-hmm. therapy technique where you put yourself in the shoes of someone in your life um, mm. that you are in relationship with, or maybe even caused harm to you as a way to work through some things. And that's actually like something people do a lot in family therapy. That's interesting to know. So I'm not surprised to hear that you are feeling that even if you're like not intentionally going in thinking of it as a therapy good exercise, it's not surprising mm-hmm. to me that you're getting the benefits of it. So that's nice to hear as someone who's just a watcher of things like this. Yeah. Um, and to kind of build on what you were talking about, Michael, in terms of like psychology and mental health, when playing a role like this mm-hmm. and having to get immersed in these experiences, what is there anything that you pull from psychology or mental health that informs the way that you act in these kind of roles? Well, I'll tell you this. Um, so getting into the character and trying to understand what the loss would be, right? He loses. Mm-hmm. His- so then what did that feel like? Where, where what's the shoe into that? Of course, I have a, a six year old son. So you have to go to these crazy places that you don't want to, uh, to put yourself in an imaginary circumstance of something happening. And you do all this work, right? You do, uh, playing a pastor. I went to, uh, uh sermons and, mm. You kind of, you just do all this layering. I watched, uh, I told Darren, I did a lot of work with Darren too. And we talked about the character because that's the beauty of having the writers there. If you're lucky enough to have that, it's pretty amazing to have access to the writers and get in their heads. But I went to, uh, I saw this YouTube video and uh, it was this guy who he he literally, if you were to cast a math teacher, like a caricature of like a math teacher, right? He was a mm-hmm. very thin guy. It was, a, this is true. This is a real thing. He was in court and uh, he had the moment to tell his son's killer to, Mm. uh, you know, at the end of the trial. And there were two on each side of him. There were two uh, 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 court officers, right? They're on each side of him. And he stood there and the guy who was up on up uh, next to the judge up in the, uh, the bench was like a huge guy too big and this is the guy who killed this man's son mm-hmm. and he got there and he stood there and he started to do his speech and uh to him and 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 express his his words and he let out this moan mm-hmm. from the depths of his soul it was like so and he was like and it came so and he grabbed he had a pen and he jumped over the the railing on and he tried to start stabbing the guy and the court officers had to pull him off and mm-hmm. and they kind of they understood 
they were careful with him, you know, and it was the first thing. And it was that, that was my first little shoe into this, you know, uh, 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 seeing what happens in this film and the tragedy that occurs with this family and me and my daughter, that, that primal, uh, primal instinct. And to see it with this guy who was so on, you'd never suspect this man to enrage like this. And it gave me the chills. This is just a true, like just in searching, mm-hmm. finding things, the psychology into this character and this circumstance. So Look, you layer it all in, right? This, other things, we, Darren and I did backstory together of how my guy became who he was. And then you let it go and you trust it and you trust it's in there. And uh, you, you you put your two feet on the ground and you, you listen and answer in the scene. And it's kind of like, like if you try to play the result of it too much, you know, mm-hmm. it's about sort of finding that pinch not the ouch so you never want to push in terms of getting into this because again i'm getting into the acting a little bit and 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 maybe a little off track but why i'm doing that is because there's nothing more important than trying to find the truth in their story and these circumstances and to sort of tell the truth so it can touch other people in a way, in a way that maybe they can't understand or understand in a, in a truthful way. So, you know, it's like if a person was in a concentration camp, you know, and you met them at a bar, or you were taught to start at a dinner and started talking, they don't, that might come out way later or conversations later, but it's not like they wear that on their sleeve, right? So the point being is we all have things inside of us crazy thoughts things that have happened things that and uh and and you want to do this work if if you can't connect or if it hasn't happened in your past you create the imaginary circumstance of it and you layer it in and then you go and play the scene okay that's great um one thing i also wanted to ask and i don't know if this will be it's not a provocative question but um so a part of the theme of the movie i picked up on is sort of the concept of closure like you guys are talking about if you had one minute with the person who wronged your family or harmed someone you loved what would you do and so i'm curious does this play into or does this part of like the fantasy of closure and sort of what are this kind of a big question but do you guys have any like personal perspectives on the concept of closure therapists were a bit jaded about that concept so i'm just curious if in writing this film I guess, where your head, where are your heads at with that concept? Well, what, what I guess I couldn't, I couldn't have known until um, sort of here we are because now, you know, the, 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 it started as this script idea that we approached our sister about and got her blessing. And then it, as Michael alluded to it, it was a very long, crazy adventure uh, as making any movie is but navigating the early days of covid um was herculean to 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 say the least um but now uh having the film uh it was uh before anyone saw it when we finally got to see the finished film and when i say we i mean uh, Michael, Jeff, and myself uh, with our editor, we were at the sound stage and watching the finished film. Uh, it was a very, uh, um, it was a very satisfying uh, experience, and and not and, and really that we hoped somebody would connect with the film. If even if a few people do, great, because you never know how people are going to respond to a film. Um, and we certainly had no idea we, from there, 30 film festivals and, you know, just tons and tons of amazing feedback uh, about the film. And watching Jody, uh, you know, we, I, we've got to experience now uh, being on two stages with her mm-hmm. and to watch an audience clap for her. And to get to see her walk around and shake hands and be this, uh, be the inspirational force that she is. And, and she had, she was the one who had the bravery to say, Hey, use my name. I want you to use my name. I want you to get my story out whenever, however you can. 
Uh, and it takes a lot of courage. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. know if I could say that. I don't know if, if I had gone through what she went through, if I could at some point in my life go, hey, yeah, just throw my story out there, get my name out. I just want to be an inspiration uh, for anyone suffering PTSD in, in the world. I mean, it's a pretty bold thing. Um, <clears throat> but to experience this sort of uh, people getting a lot of uh, entertainment value from the film, also having a m meaningful and sort of um, a, a profound experience in hearing about Jody's story, the inspiration, because we, we've now got to tell her story in many interviews. And, and like I said, seeing her on stage is what it showed me as far as closure goes is that I feel like to a degree uh, to, you know, never, I don't know. I don't know if you could ever have complete closure on, on something that, uh, that traumatic. I don't know. Um, uh, but I can tell you that I, I have learned that through art, uh, through art and creativity and getting together um we i think we did create uh a sort of triumphant cathartic experience for us as a family and uh going back to the origins of jody's story and talking about art that also relates to michael lombardi and re relates to the show that he was on uh rescue me um Aaron, you, should michael, tell you want to take it from there no, tell what's Brittany, that? Tell Brittany. Sorry to interrupt, but I think we need to hear the story of what happened to Jody. And again, um, you know, Brittany, I never want you to think that uh, we're sort of. I mean, well, these are her brothers, so she, <laughs> she wants this story told. We never want you to think we're like sort of exploiting this. It's something mm -hmm. that inspiration and something that was discussed. But I think we've been talking about the inspiration and in their sister and this this uh, dramatic uh traumatic experience so if you're if you're open to it i think these guys should be able to tell you what what happened and i think it ties in um it, it's it, it ties in first of all it is the story the film and it's the inspiration but it'll tie into the 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 podcast quite nicely as well on the subject matter sure i'd love to hear it if you guys are open to telling yeah 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 of course um so basically it was essentially uh gotta get my dates right on this time just flies but uh it was maybe roughly 16 years ago or so um my sister she was very young she was walking home from a friend's house a couple uh like a block or two away from her house and this is a suburban northern california town um she, she was with her friends. Then she was like alone, literally, for just a matter of a few minutes. It was late at night. She thought she heard a jogger running behind her. And she just heard these really loud footsteps. And she was walking next to a ravine. There was like a little section that was sort of near a highway. And there was like this ravine. At, and she, again, she was uh, walking into her neighborhood and she said she had a moment of going gosh who's jogging this late at night and she moved to the side to sort of give the person space and literally next thing she knows she is tackled full mm. force down this 22 foot ravine so from there uh this is where the horrors really uh began this this person assaulted her viciously raped her and really uh, attempted to kill her. She she had a belt around her neck. Um, she miraculously survived and sort of um, uh, outwitted, fought, did everything she could to get out of there. And she ended up getting out of there. Um, climbed out, track uh, uh, um, tracked down a car and was she very luckily survived because the odds of a stranger attack um of that sort the odds of surviving that are are very very low they're very low this typically uh, a murder um and those kind of attacks are very rare that gentleman was i uh, call him a gentleman that person was not caught for years and years um mm -hmm. 10 years went by and he was not caught 
And then after 10 years, uh, through advancements in DNA, they got a DNA match because this guy was attempting to do this to someone else. Mm. Um, and what's very scary about the whole thing is that it was in the same area 10 plus years later, and he was a taxi driver. So uh, th- uh, he was caught. He ended up going to trial. Uh, and that's when the trial phase began. That went on for a long time. That's when the nugget of the idea was sort of born and uh, for the movie. And then um, uh, the, the as I say, there are sort of multiple happy endings here. One, uh, the most important happy ending is that Jody, uh, our sister, uh, not only survived, but after a very difficult uh, subsequent years of PTSD, uh, ended up thriving and becoming a very successful, happy, healthy person. And she happens to be uh, one of the few female fire uh, fire captains in the United States, and um, she's just awesome, awesome human. She's 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 the best. Um, the second happy ending is the guy was convicted and he was virtually put away for life. He'll he'll come up for parole when he's an old man, and hopefully we'll be able to keep him in there. And then the the third part being you know when this all start this all right around the same time as we had come up with this idea independent of that jody had approached us and said do we know anyone in the in the documentary space she said you know after everything she went through with ptsd she wants to get her story out so that she can be an example um, that you can get through it, that there's ways, there's pa- there's pathways through really, really severe PTSD. And we attempted that. We attempted to find, you know, oh, geez, I don't know if I know anybody in the d- documentary space. And I we did some digging and looking and then on a whim brought up the retaliators as like a, hey, you may think this is a crazy idea, uh, but what do you think? And she went, great. I don't. She's like, I don't care. I, yeah, if you can make it into a movie and you can use that as the platform to get my name out, please. Um, and we told her, you know, it's not going to be your exact story, but it'll be a kickoff point and, and blah, blah, blah. And she said, yeah, do it. Do it. You have my blessing. Go do it. So the weird part where this connects up to Michael is that when we finished the script, um, the first person we sent it to was Michael and um, Michael responded to it very, very quickly and was essentially, he was on a plane in three days. He's on the East coast. We're on the West coast. And he showed up uh, at our doorstep in three days and was like, okay, I'm going to get this movie made where, you know, I'm born to play this role of John Bishop and I'm going to get this movie made. And, uh, we formed a partnership basically um, right away. Independent of this, what I did not, I was not even aware of was that um, my sister in, well, Michael, why don't you tell this part of the story? Cause this is, this will sound cool coming from you. <laughs> well, I think you're doing a great job. Um, but uh, uh, yeah. So, so basically um she was uh, in, in proby school, right? During the time of when this happened, she was a, a, a firefighter training school. This is when she was around eighteen, right? When the when the attack happened, Darren. Right. Yeah. So she then um, ended up, as Darren said, becoming a firefighter. And I was on a television show called rescue me as darren said earlier which is about new york city firefighters post 9 11 and the 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 issues that they and and that sort of the uh the demons that they deal with on a day-to-day basis and it turns out that that was jody's like favorite television show and it was uh as she tells it um part of her healing process it made her laugh and it made her cry and it made her see firefighters 
as real human beings who were fighting these demons and had PTSD and all these different issues, but were still going into burning buildings to save people and still doing their job. And one of the things that was interesting about um, about uh, Rescue Me was we the guys had issues in the firehouse, you know, and and, and it was funny because we would uh, there were firemen at the time who had issues with the show because but but it was more more like the senior guys did and then they you know at the end of the day after you know 100 episodes they got it because we did have you do have to hollywoodize something a little bit but it was issues like this like the captain in the show he's an old man and he's has a gambling problem and he's walking into a a a a, 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 a an old woman's apartment and he he He's not that old. I said he was an old man, but she, <laughs> and he and he opens. He kicks a pot like the the the, the cabinet sort of doors open and money falls out. Like that's where she hides her money, and he takes it because of his gambling issue. And then he does end up returning it. But just the different things that these guys had to go through as human beings on the show, and that's what I'm most proud of of being on a show like that. Dennis Leary, he wrote it, he produced it, um, he starred in it, he co-created. And, um, like in fires, for instance, it was all smoke. It's, he wanted it. So it wasn't like man against flame, like backdraft. He wanted it <laughs> chaotic point is very real. And Jody latched onto this show because she was a probationary firefighter. And here's the crazy serendipitous part is that, I mean, it all is, but that I played the probie. Mm-hmm. Um, I was the probationary firefighter. So she connected with my character a lot. And it's so interesting that as these guys tell it and Jody, that I was her favorite character. And then I, here I am the lead in her. Fa- and these guys didn't even know this, right? We didn't even know it. <laughs> no, we didn't know. We, we, I, I figured, well, knowing she was a firefighter, well, she must be a rescue me fan. And I remember when I first told her, I knew Michael Lombardi and I was working with him. She didn't even believe me. She, and, and she was like, yeah, right. Right. I said no, I did because we we worked in music together year, uh, years before. It's where we met, and come to find out, she didn't really believe me. She was like, I just couldn't believe it I, because she was turns out completely obsessed with Michael and his character, and was just like, you know, she she really credits the show as helping her in those times. She said she just kind of watched it on a loop. So when we told her. Michael was the star of the film who is in a way sort of the surrogate her father in in, in the movie because you know the character's name John my dad's name is John uh not a coincidence you know um uh and and uh and so you know it was beyond she, she, we we called her we facetimed her because I finally started realizing she wasn't believing me and Michael was over and he, he we FaceTimed her and she was in her firehouse and the show, you know, rescue me in a firehouse is, is about as, you know, it's about as, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they put it on a very high pedestal as like the only, you know, firefighter show, hmm. uh, w- worth its salt. And so she's running around the firehouse showing everybody Michael Lombardi's on the phone and freaking out. And it's, it was, it was, it was hilarious. So, but it really made it like, wow, unbelievable. Yeah. And I, I just wanted to add, um, Brittany, cause I know you were asking about closure and like how all this sort of relates to closure and what our, maybe our personal opinions are about it. And, um, you know, I, I, I you know, I think I'm with you, uh, maybe having some kind, or I don't know if you were expressing that opinion for yourself or just for the general, uh, you know, uh, consensus of psychologists, but you know, I'm, I, I, I'm pretty skeptical of, uh, the concept of closure. I, I, I actually, I think that might be what drives people to uh, want to take revenge. You know, it's this desire to make it all go away forever. You know, this mm. awful feeling and to sort of settle the score once and for all. And um, it, really like in writing the film and doing all these great things, all these wins that we really had with telling, you know, uh, helping Jody's story get out there. I don't look at it as closure, but in a, in a sense, it's like the writing of the script itself. It's it's this outlet for mm. giving it some air, you know what I mean, uh, of coping with it as it comes, mm. you know. And I think that you know it, it, this doesn't make 
the 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 traumatic event that happened to Jody go away, you know. Right. But it but it is a sort of vessel to sort of you know di- maybe direct um, or canal to direct that that trauma through as as it becomes more difficult to deal with, you know, or if if it does arise out, you know, arise in a way where it is difficult to deal with. So, so yeah, I, I, I think it's an interesting way to frame the question because I do think that in a sense, the, you know, one of the anti-heroes of the film in in a sense, also a villain, uh, Jed, uh, I think he is someone who, um, it takes that to the extreme of trying to find that closure. And the irony is he, he never finds it. Because he no. just keeps it, it, the violence begets violence, begets violence. You know, it's almost like a drug at that point. You know what I mean? Yeah, that you was know. the point was that you see if you took revenge to its furthest depraved, sadistic end, it still isn't enough because it became about... right. Not only could he, you know, did he, again, spoiler alert, I'll try to be a little vague. <laughs> Not only did he keep things going for his own situation all the, those years, but then he started having to do it vicariously through others. And him taunting uh, uh, Michael's character and saying, it's time for you to heal, which is a mm-hmm. big moment in the movie. You know, <clears throat> I, I believe the character in that moment really believes that. I think Jed believes that, yeah. but we see the audience can see it's not, <laughs> you know, it's not that easy, right? He's, he's, like, he's lying to himself, you know. He's, li- he's well, deluded. he's had to trade a right. normal life for this very depraved life, and so and, and that obviously ends up being very uh, uh, having a lot of crazy outcomes <laughs> yeah it's yeah, hard yeah. it's hard because we're digging we're digging so deep into the psychology it's hard his to version uh, avoid of, some of yeah, this stuff yeah it seems like you know his ver- you know pe- some people can have a version of healing that is closure that might be self-destructive and you know perpetuating the pain and even aggravating it and making it worse you know um yeah i think that's an, something, that's just an interesting way to frame it yeah so something i want to say too is we uh jeff and i were committed to this very early and then we had many conversations with michael about this and that is that in writing the film we really as as writers felt a responsibility to not judge uh the characters or telegraph uh personal uh opinions in other words you know well, here's what you should do in this situation, or here's what you shouldn't do. Um, we really tried to let the characters create characters and then, again, create a dramatic situation where it would be entertaining for the audience to wrestle. You know, my favorite scene in the film is the moment where uh, John Bishop, Michael Lombardi's character, is confronted with the question and without giving things away <clears throat> it's a long scene and you really see him struggle and that's my favorite part of the film because that was really the essence of what w- i feel like it was nailed i feel like th- through the directing the editing the acting it all really comes together in that i don't feel like the camera is judging those two characters. I don't feel like the actors are telegraphing uh, <clears throat> what they want, or, or, or you know, or what the right thing, or who's the good guy, who's the bad guy. I really feel like it's a moment where the audience has to stare down their own thoughts and wait, what would I do? I've had so many people. I had a really good friend of ours. I'll give him a shout out. His name Rudy, uh, writer, attorney, amazing, amazing guy. And he, uh, he, he, when he saw the film, he called me and said, man, I'm, I am pissed at you. And I said, I said, well, why? And this is a, I mean, the mensch of all mensch of, of human beings, this guy. And he's like, you really made me confront 
something I never, I, I just, you know, he's like, I would never imagine I could do anything like that. But in, in that scene I was really wrestling with my sort of con- being confronted with, geez, what, what, gosh, that's not the right thing to do. And I, I, I why do I feel, and, th- you know, call us sadistic. That's what we wanted. You know, we really <laughs> wanted the, the, that, you know, I made me laugh. You know, I laughed when he heard it, but I've heard it from multiple people that said, gosh, I really felt so conflicted and I didn't know what to think. And I just, that's great. You know, it's just so easy to just, this is wrong. This is good. And, and it's kind of boring. I, I, I like cinema that sort of challenges you and makes you have to do a little of the work as the audience, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I've been nodding very knowingly while you've all been talking, because I think what I appreciated watching the movie, like as a therapist, is that you're right in that the movie plays around with the idea of closure and the fantasy of closure, because as a therapist, why I was nodding emphatically at times while you were talking is that I think it's this idea about like there's an answer. And if I can find the answer, all of my feelings will go away and I won't feel bad anymore. And What we have to all be honest with ourselves about is that there isn't really an answer. That's very frustrating. When I, as a therapist, when I work with clients, I say you have to let go of this idea that there's an answer over here. And that sometimes that is closure. It's an action. It's I say the right thing to the right person. Sometimes people think I'm withholding the answer from them in therapy. (laughs) Like I'm just not telling them the thing that's going to make everything different. And so I think what your movie does and also what we try to encourage clients is that there's never going to be one thing that makes this bad mm-hmm. thing just disappear out of your life. It's a part of you now. When you go through a trauma, it integrates inside of you. And you're mm-hmm. never going to be the person you were before that happened. But that doesn't right. mean that your life is over or your life is bad. Mm-hmm. And we have to radically accept that and reconcile that. And so I did yeah. appreciate in watching it that you guys don't, not to spoil, you guys don't take, I think, what would be the simplistic turn with that. And that right. sort of indulging in that revenge fantasy and showing right. that right. you it can eat you up because you don't find the answers mm-hmm. and you're like, oh, well, maybe the answer's down there. And then you're like, well, I couldn't find it there. So maybe it's down here. And then like the Jed character you're talking about, now you're just wandering around and you don't even know where you are anymore. And right. so I think that was all done very well. And I appreciate that as a therapist. It surprised oh, wow. me pleasantly. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, I never <laughs> thought of it that there was a different yeah because there is look there are fantasy revenge films that do scratch an itch you know mm-hmm. uh but this is yeah. not quite that i don't want right. to give too much away in saying it but our, yeah that was and it was very deliberately not just that you know yeah and we're big fa- we're big fans of that aesthetic you know we love we love the gritty 70s um Mm-hmm. revenge exploitation films we love the charles bronson films and <laughs> right right there, there is there is a there is a satisfaction in that kind of cinema because it isn't real life and mm-hmm. and it isn't uh, right. life isn't so clean and yeah i appreciate you saying that because um we we uh we, we one of the terms that we use with michael was this sort of we would say thinking man's hostile, but we didn't mean, I, I want to make clear too, because I, I love Hostel. I think it's one of the best modern day horror films, uh, modern, you know, last 20 years or so. Yeah, uh, I second that. <laughs> I, 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 I think it's a, a, a masterpiece. So when I say thinking man's, I don't mean a smarter movie than, than Hostel uh, or a more <laughs> thought out movie than Hostel. What I, what I mean by that is in hostile the horror of that movie is that these people are torturing people truly for the thrill of torturing people because they're so they're such sociopaths they're so bored with life they're so you know um you know they're um, i guess you would just have to be past malignantly narciss- narcissistic at that point and just be a full sociopath to uh do partake in something like that and it's that horror of humanity that you go somebody could do that 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 is for what makes for me what makes that movie so uh like it just hits me in the gut because it's really hard to, for me to put my head around 
doing that to another human being just for kicks. So the whole thought of with retaliators was, well, what if we built up enough backstory and took our time enough to where we could take an audience member into, uh, could you do that? Could, would you now personally? No, I don't think that's the answer. Right. But the fun of it was to go, let's, Let's really let's really go there. Yeah, you know, Michael, we've been going on and on. Where do we <laughs> say something? No, I, I I'm I think you're filling the the space quite nicely. Um, I think that you also uh, I've been asked like, what would you do? You know, and I, <laughs> and to get back uh, to what Darren said earlier, I think what's so interesting about this too is they took a man of the cloth. You know, they took a past. Right. And put him in this situation who's who's uh so so i think you know it's it's um it's hard to answer uh, honestly because you can judge this from a seat pretty easily yeah um, but if you're really confronted with it and uh that really happened that kind of loss um and the way in which it well, happens it's uh i think it's a tough it's a tough thing uh to to digest and 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 say what you would do uh either way unless it would really happen and you know the thing is you could be like i think that's what's crazy about the film is half the people are like yeah get him get him get him and then maybe the other half <laughs> sort of on the fence right they're with right. Jed, but what he's doing is wrong but they understand right. it and it makes you right. think but uh, you know if you really were if you had this person in front of you, would you really be able to hurt another human being in that moment? You right. Know? Mm -hmm. Right. Really hurt a person. That's kind right. of crazy to see, like to hurt skin and, you know, mm -hmm. flesh and see blood. And are you capable? Yeah. Of yeah. And, Even and simultaneously, could you walk away? Right. It's like, that's the, <clears throat> and I, I love what you said, Michael, it's true. Cause there's, we've gotten that reaction where people are, they they say, oh boy, I was about to get upset because I was so invested in Bishop and I thought he was going to cross over there. And so I was so happy that he didn't do that. And boy, I was like, not. And then, as Michael said, have had other people, man, you know, I just wish he would have done just a little something, just a little, you know, I just, because I was, you know, so it is interesting, you know, there, and that was, again, that's all music for, for us because, uh, and I appreciate your your insights in, into that because uh, we, it's really what we aimed for. Well, and I think if if I'm listening to Brittany right, that that latter half of the audience uh, might need to get uh, a little help. <laughs> yeah, they might just you know have something going on that I would hope that they would go to a therapist to maybe talk yeah. that through. What you needs know, are we trying but, to get? You know, to, to be clear, but, I love all of our audience. Uh, I'm not but, disparaging but, them. Th th there Jeff, should be no stigma. I, there. <clears throat> Jeff, where I would where I would clap back at you. I'm just kidding. Don't you, I hate don't that you clap at um, me? <laughs> <laughs> no, but to push back on that a little bit, yeah, what Michael yeah. was saying is I think a very good point, which is that it's very easy right here to say, yeah, that's the wrong thing to do. And I agree. I think the challenge right. of the film and, and where people get caught up is when you play out that imaginary circumstance of you really are going through it and here they are presented to you on a plate. Right. It's, right. You, you are confronted with an animalistic thought of, well, wait a minute, if I am in that emotional state, could I resist that temptation? And that's where I think, because I think, yes, I do think academically, I would assume most people would, would say, well, yeah, that's the wrong thing to do. And, and, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think there's something to be said about when you're in that emotional, there's also, you so know, I as thought, a parent, there, there's yeah, a, there's a, yeah. There's a protectiveness that may be unreasonable sometimes, but it is just sort of there. And and <clears throat> you, how do you deal with it? You know. So anyway, just earlier you said something. You, you, really, you call your therapist first. <laughs> That's how you deal with it. No, no. But I think actually, what actually no, I I I meant that really as just a joke, only because. Well, well, look, it's a film. When you're rooting for a character to do something in a film, it's not the same as rooting for a person in real life right, to do right, something right. to another human being as well. Mm -hmm. So, 
something to be said for that. And Brittany, earlier you said something very heavy and you were like, look, you, uh, and it, it, this isn't to quote you, but I think it was uh, leaning into this idea of when something like this could happen or something dramatic and traumatic happens, you, you, you know, you're never going to be the same again. Right. Uh, yeah. So what's crazy is when you said that, like, it was like, wow, you know, you're never going to be the same <laughs> person again. Right. Like everything changed. Yeah. So then part of me just justified why I would want to do revenge because I wouldn't, <laughs> I'm never going to, you, you know what I'm saying? Like you, cause I, I'm thinking through the character I'm th now and I'm right, not, right. you know, if someone did something like that to my child, uh, you're never going to be the same again anyway, so you might as well get the guy. You know what I mean? Because your life's changed forever. I'm saying yeah. there's real things you could think. I'm not condoning. Yeah. I'm not saying one way or the other, but I remember like right, right. having to deal with all these questions when I was getting, uh, you know, pre mm. prepared with the script. So yeah, and I think sort of that, like, part of being going through trauma is also there's like a hopeless component to it so and thinking of it through Major. like a therapist mm -hmm. that thought process combined with that could definitely lead to self-destructive behaviors probably not to the extent of this movie but versions mm -hmm. of it mm -hmm. and so where we try to go in therapy is that you're never going to be the same again and that's not necessarily a bad thing like you're not going to be yeah. a worse version of yourself on the other side so you don't have to like right. dive bomb your life a very like right. fuck it mentality right. like right, it's more right. like how do we integrate who you were and who you are now without having to sacrifice some version of yourself or shut right. down your emotional self i think also with the idea of like closure is that like i said if i can just do this thing then the heart the, the pain will go away and so it's more like how do we integrate the pain and kind of what you're talking about with your sister jody like sometimes part of that growth is how do i use this pain in my experience to create meaning from that either by helping others sharing my story you know getting into like more post-traumatic growth which is a new concept a newer concept in mental health that people are talking about more and more and that part of that can be like finding meaning from what's happened and then right. using that in a positive way that aligns with the values we hold right. now and the values we held before and so with like your character of bishop you know i think part of how he goes through the movie is by the end melding those things together how do i still live by my values uh -huh. and not sacrificing my core self while also integrating that i am a slightly different person now because something right. wilds happened yeah. to me um series of wild things um, in the course of this movie yeah and bishop by the end is is he is not the same he, mm -hmm. he is changed forever but what yeah. but you know well i guess i don't want to give too much of the movie but yeah, I'll just leave it there. He's not the same. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know you guys have been very generous with your time. Um, is there anything else you want um, the listeners to take away from this conversation or seeing the movie? And also, where can the retaliators be found? Where can people experience Every, it? Everywhere you can rent or buy movies, it is available. Video on demand. So that's Apple, I, you know, iTunes, Amazon, Vudu, Google Play, Redbox, mm -hmm. a whole bunch. Uh, and right now in America and Canada, and uh, we will be going into uh, more places soon. Right. Yeah, I want to say that I realized, you know, uh, and I've realized this a long time ago, which is, I guess, just haven't thought about it, uh, how, how important, uh, you know, therapists are. And, and I think, and I say this, uh, in life but what i meant also was just because i was thinking about how helpful you would be and would have been to talk to about this role actually oh, yeah. thank you so obviously yeah. that applies to yeah. humans and behavior <laughs> right what trying to do as actors and storytellers <laughs> so um it, it's interesting because you opened up my thought process actually and part of what you said made me made me want to take revenge you put me on that side to be on 100 mm -hmm. would but i know we haven't had a real session here I'm just <laughs> yeah the, some of the little tidbits and maybe it's the mood i'm in or whatever and that's another thing right like wherever uh -huh. and it was like 
So it was interesting to talk and sort of peel the onion back with you a little bit and get to the, you know, feel the rawness of, of some of this topic. So depending on how much you are yeah. for the session, next role. <laughs> I'll send you an yeah, invoice. Well, well, yeah, we, we, might, we might have to consult with you from now on before we yeah, uh, yeah, that, that would be cool. our next uh, script. But, you know, I, I, just one thing I wanted to mention uh, before we go, I, I, this just came to me right now, was that, you know, I think what makes John Bishop's story sort of unique, too, is that he is somebody that, in his corner of the world has all the answers mm. in a way, you know, and I think for some people that have that profile, they have that personality type where they're usually the educator, the person that consoles people, you know, we see him in the movie, you know, talking to people, you know, kind of consoling them a little bit. It's where do they turn? You know, it can mm -hmm. feel a little like, wait, I'm supposed to have the answers here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, really therapy really benefits everybody you know we don't <laughs> all have the answer so <laughs> and even you know. therapists go to therapy you know exactly. some people put their nose yeah. up at that but about well, that's part of what you just said jeffrey though With retaliators too mom <laughs> therapist it has oh no <laughs> <laughs> where we can go right interesting well i'll have more yeah. say probably in that opinion wise <laughs> Um, but thank you all so much. It's been so fun to chat and yeah, everyone keep your eyes out for retaliators. It sounds like it's widely available. So if this chat has sparked your interest, I would encourage everyone to check it out. Thank you all for joining me. Thank you, Darren, Jeffrey, and Michael. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you.